Okay, the recording is started. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the class, BC 214, Developing the Human Spirit. So let's uh, pray together, and then we will get the class started. Um, just request somebody to lead us to lead the class in prayer. Could somebody um, please unmute your mic and just pray with all of us? All right. Um, Maggie. And then to please pray with us. Okay, thank you, Pastor. Let, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to learn how to develop our mind, Lord, so that to develop our spirit, Lord, so that we, we are in tune with your word, we're in tune with your Holy Spirit, Lord, so that we, we may bear much fruit, Lord, and we may also walk close to you. We may hear you personally, Lord. We will be, become one as you, you are one with the Father, Jesus. Be with us, be with Pastor Ashish. Give him right words and right way of speaking things so that we, our feeble mind can understand and can grasp what he's teaching. In your mighty name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Maggie. Once again, good morning to each of you. Thanks for connecting to the class today. So we're going to start off with just an introduction and overview of what this course is about, what um, uh, is our motivation uh, in this course, what are we trying to achieve, and then we will get into the first lesson. So let's look at the course overview. I have um, shared these PDFs. All right, so BC214, Developing the Human Spirit. So what are we, what's the motivation and why are we doing this course? Now I have to also inform all of us that uh, this is the first time we are doing this course uh, at uh, the Bible College. So, um, you know, it's, uh, we are putting this, uh, this course together. Now, the motivation as to why we decided to introduce this course is simply this, that uh, what we have been seeing in the, in the Christian church, and I'm specifically talking about the, uh, uh, the training of ministers. So when you look at Bible colleges, when you look at seminaries and the kind of training that's happening, a, a lot of emphasis is being placed on intellectually understanding things. So, you know, you've there's a lot of intellectual knowledge and people argue and debate and there are differing ideas and opinions and so on the same on the same theological subject you will have a wide range of opinions and ideas and so on and so forth and so um, the, there's so much of intellectual exercise happening uh, in 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 colleges in uh, in that are preparing people for ministry. But when you really look at it, uh, ministry is something that flows out of our spirit and not just of our minds. And uh, we do believe in developing our minds. Uh, that means we need to be intellectually sharp and strong and all of that. But uh, no devil is going to leave just because if, you know, we are intellectually strong demons are not going to flee and uh, we're not going to be necessarily able to help people spiritually just because we're intellectually strong. Uh, uh, 
that requires something different, which is being spiritually strong, right? Because um, the work of the ministry, as we will see, is something that comes out of our spirit. Paul said, you know, uh, I serve God with my spirit, Romans chapter 1. So really the ministry we are doing is something that comes, is a spiritual work. Of course, we need a sharp mind and we need a healthy body uh, to serve God, but it comes out of our spirit. And also, the Christian life that we live, it is a it is a life in the spirit, right? The Bible tells us uh, to walk in the spirit. Yeah, yes, we're going to use our mind, our renewed mind, uh, but we have to walk in the spirit. That means the condition of my spirit, my spiritual being is gonna really determine my Christian life that I live here on earth. Uh, it's not dependent on just my intellectual um, strength. So, uh, so we're not against being intellectually sharp and strong and develop, developing our mind, but the emphasis should be equally placed or perhaps even more so on the development of the spirit but unfortunately, all our efforts in training ministers and also in the church and ministering to people seems to focus on the mind, on the intellectual part. And uh, there's hardly much done for the development of the spirit. And so it is from that burden, so to speak, or from that observation that we said, you know, we really, we really need to put the emphasis where the emphasis should be, which is on developing our spiritual lives. Um, and so that's why you know we said, okay, let's bring this course in to help all of us understand the human spirit, and then to understand the the faculties and the functions of the human spirit. Uh, to understand how God deals with us in our spirit and then into our mind and body. And having received that understanding, we also want to talk about what are the ways we see in scripture to develop the human spirit. The ultimate objective is so that we will all be strong in our spirit and then life and ministry can happen from our spirit and out into our mind and body. So uh, that's the burden, that's the motivation behind this course. Um, uh, you know, we, we've thought about these things in different bits and pieces, but to bring them all together in a course and then to uh, share it uh, and, and, and share it with our students, uh, this is the first time uh, we are doing it. And so it's going to be a learning process for everyone. Uh, we are going to learn how to bring the course uh, to the students and also as questions are asked and we have interactions. Uh, you know, we will definitely learn and grow in this together. But it's really amazing uh, to see how much is there in the scriptures concerning what the function and the role of the human spirit is. And we are going to uh, discover that in this course. Uh, the rest of the things are pretty much uh, standard, uh, except that uh, for this course, we are going to do just one lecture a week. So, you know, this is the first time we're doing it. So we'll just um, allocate one hour and we'll see how things go, how things play out. And, uh, you know, we, we could make changes in the future. Um, the assessment is standard. You know, I'll, we'll have three assessments and the same standard grading. All right. So that's a quick introduction or, or a, a motivation as to why we have uh, introduced this course. And I trust that um, all of us will benefit uh, from this course. Any questions before we get started on the course, about the course? Yes, Samuel, please go ahead. Um, more like, uh... 
logistical observation, Pastor. Um, uh, I think uh, so. Monday, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Monday, um, the second and third hour we have. Uh, so second hour we have this course, and third hour I think we have another course with you. Uh, and uh, so let me pull up my calendar. But um, I mean. I was thinking, uh, and and there is. Uh, oh, you're saying so, uh, two hours of holiness do it today and move. Um, right. Develop the human spirit to Wednesday morning. Um, right. That's possible. Uh, that could have been done, I think. Um, but um, yeah, but let's leave things as they are for now because. Okay. Uh, the <laughs> the schedule has been published and right, right. Uh, different so, students yeah. may have planned things. I mean, yeah, that interchange could be done. Uh, typically, if, if we had only in-person classes, we would have made the change. But since we have uh, uh, online classes and all that, uh, I think it's a little, it might throw a few people off in their schedule if you change it now. Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Good. Anything else? Any other question about the course before we get started? All right. I hope all of you are excited. I hope silence doesn't mean, oh, no, I just sit through another one. <laughs> but I hope you're excited to uh, explore this area with me. And uh, it's an it's an exploration. And, uh, and uh, we also want to develop ourselves uh, as we journey through this. Okay, so let's get started in our very first chapter, or as we get started, uh, the first thing we want to emphasize is uh, the first section, you're understanding the human spirit. So in this first section, we want to uh, get to unpack or uncover or dis discover. Um, you know what? What is the the human spirit all about, and how does you know how does what are the faculties of the spirit? Uh, what are how does the the spirit world, God, and the dark side of the world, spirit world, interact with the human spirit? And uh, you know what role does the spirit play in our everyday life? So we want to unpack some of those things just to understand. Um, the human spirit and how God deals with us, how God interacts with our spirit. That's what we're going to do in this section. So we probably have number four or five chapters in section one, and then we'll get into section two, which is the functions of the human spirit. And then later on to section three, which is developing what are the practical things God has given to us to make the spirit strong. All right, so let's get started now. What I've done is uh, you know, I've just put the references and uh, we will have to turn into our Bibles and read the scripture text and um, look at it together. So let's start off with some familiar scriptures. First Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23. Oh, I, I haven't shared my... Sorry. I was excitedly talking and none of you were able to see this. Okay. All right. Okay, so let's turn to First Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23, please. Somebody could read that out for us. Shall I read, Pastor? Please go ahead. <clears throat> First Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 23 says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit soul and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. So this is a very familiar passage to us, but just to emphasize or probably re-emphasize, reiterate that we as human beings, the Bible reveals to us that we are tripart beings. All right, so right here, Paul saying, may God, may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved. 
So it says, may God preserve you, you know, protect you, keep you safe, keep you well, keep you whole in spirit, soul, and body right, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, so we're focusing on that man as tripart beings, spirit, soul, and body. And we have seen this before, but just to review or repeat, uh, the body is the outer shell. So in other places in scripture, the body is referred to as a tent. Uh, the body is referred to as a house or a temple. So it's, it's a dwelling place. It's, it's the outer shell. And then, so it's, the, it's with the physical body that we relate to the natural realm, the realm in which we live. Then we have the soul, which is our mind, our will, and emotions. So it's the, the, the Greek word is suke, uh, which re refers to the psychological part of us. So in some ways, we can think about it as the functions of the brain, but it's not limited to the functions of the brain. There is also the intangible aspect, which is the mind and the emotions. So some of it, you know, can be understood physiologically, but some of it cannot be understood physiolo physiologically. It's beyond that. Um, it's the, the mind and the realm of emotions. But all of that comprise what the Bible refers to as the soul, the mind, the will, the emotions. And then there, and, and, and we are really spirit beings. So spirit. The spirit is the eternal part of us, which enables us to communicate with God or enables us to interact with the spiritual realm. And the spirit is able to influence the soul and also the body. So spirit, soul, and body, right? So the body will die and stop functioning and die. And so the Bible tells us the body without the spirit is dead. So when the body dies, the spirit leaves the body. The soul is the intermediary. So it has, a, it connects us between the spirit and the body. So there is the physiological side to the soul, which is the functions of the brain. There is also the intangible aspects of the soul, which really connects to the body. And sometimes, and as we will see in the New Testament, together, spirit and soul, the Bible talks about it as the inner man, the inner man, right? So when we use the term inner man, uh, sometimes, depending on the context, it could mean exclusively the spirit, or it could be the soul and spirit together. But when we talk about the soul, we're talking about the intangible aspect of the soul connected with the spirit, which formed the inner man. Okay. So those are things we have seen before. And um, uh, let's also uh, read Hebrews 4.12. I know there's a question maybe on the chat. Uh, oh, the class will come, come to it. Uh, Hebrews 4 and verse 12. Can somebody read that for us, please? Hebrews 4, verse 12. Hebrews 4, verse 12. It says, For the word of God is, a living, is living and active, sharper than two-edged sword, piercing the division of soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow, and descending the thought and intention of the heart. Mm. So... What we see here in Hebrews 4.12, what I want to point out is that there is a division of soul and spirit. That means these are two distinct parts of us. Right? There is overlap. Like we were saying, there's an overlap between the spirit and soul. There's an overlap between the soul and the body. There's connectivity. There's overlap. But yet there's also distinctiveness. Because the word of God divides soul and spirit. We can 
distinguish, set apart, separate, soul and spirit. So there is that distinctiveness between soul and spirit. They're not the same thing. Sometimes in some parts of Christian world, they just talk about the soul and the spirit as they are the same thing, but they are not. They are the, the word of God separates soul and spirit. That means they are distinct and they can be, um, you know, uh, treated in isolation as well. So soul and spirit, the word of God divides soul and spirit. And then I want you all to see uh, what it says. And of joints and marrow. So just as I was talking about, just as there is the, um, uh, the, the physical, uh, it touches our soul and spirit, joints and marrow. And it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So here you have another word, heart. Now, the heart, as we know, is not the physical organ, but the heart is interchangeable with the spirit. So the human spirit in the New Testament is also referred to as the heart. Right? Uh, we will see uh, in, in, in First Peter chapter 3, uh, I know I didn't put it down there, we will look at it, we can look at it right now and we will also um, um, uh, come to it a little later. Could we go to First Peter three and verse four, please? First Peter chapter three and verse four. Okay, First Peter chapter three and verse four. But let your adorning be, sorry, be the hidden person of your heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is God's sight, which in God's sight is very precious. Mm, thank you. What I want to point out here from First Peter 3, 4, is that the word heart and spirit are used synonymously, which is what I was pointing out from Hebrews 4, 12. So he's, saying, he's talking about the hidden person of the heart. And then he talks about a gentle and quiet spirit. So heart, spirit, used interchangeably. I'll mention this in passing. We will come back to it. But I want what I want you to see in First Peter 3, 4 is he talks about the hidden person of the heart. That means the heart or the spirit is your hidden person, your inner person. It means it's the real you. And what he's, of course, bringing out in First Peter 3 is let the graces of the hidden person come forth. Let it you know, adorn your life with the graces of the inner person. But going back to Hebrews 4.12, the word of God separates spirit and soul. But he also uses the word heart. And in the New Testament, the word heart is used synonymously with the human spirit. Now, the reason I'm saying in the New Testament is because in the Old Testament, you will find that the word heart is usually talking about the inner person. That means the inner man, the spirit and soul together many times because the, the functions of the heart would be spirit and soul together in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, it's pretty distinct. Uh, spirit referring to the heart. And we will look, uh, our goal in this course is to understand the human spirit or the human heart. And here you're seeing in Hebrews 4.12, the thoughts and intents of the heart, right? So that means there are the deep motivations that come from the spirit of man. In as much as we have things that come from the mind of man, which is the soulish part of us, there are also the thoughts and the intents, the motivations uh, that come from the heart. Or as we saw a little uh, in First Peter 3, 4, it's the hidden person, uh, the real person is, uh, is the 
heart or the spirit of man. Okay. So we've looked at three scriptures, 1 Thessalonians 5.23, Hebrews 4.12, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 4. I'm going to pause here and just um, see what the question is uh, that's been raised up. All right. All right. So there's a question. Uh, please provide the Bible reference for the soul consisting of mind, will, and emotions. So there is no actual verse of scripture that talks about the soul consisting of mind, will, and emotions. There's no singular verse that explains that. But uh, what we do, uh, this the statement that we make is based on how the scriptures treat the soul. So we do have scriptures like uh, Romans 12, 2, talking about the mind, be renewed, uh, about the renewing of the mind. Um, and uh, uh, the, uh, yeah, and some other, other scriptures, you know, concerning the mind. So based on that, the, you know, the, the, I would say the cumulative list of scriptures in the New Testament concerning the soul in connection with the mind and emotions, uh, we put it together. Okay, so there is no uh, chapter and verse um, that actually tells us the soul is mind, will, and emotions, but it's just a cumulative look at all these scriptures that we generally arrive at this conclusion. But as I said earlier, there is an overlap right, between soul and spirit because of the interconnectivity. There is an overlap between soul and body because of the interconnectivity. And on this end, we understand the brain. We understand that the physiological side, the brain, as you start look at it from psychology, okay, so the brain influences our thinking, our emotions, our feelings, etc. Right. So, uh, okay. All right. Uh, there is right. So there's another question from Beth on understanding the spirit. Uh, the question is, um, if the mind, will, and emotions comes under the soul, what really is there left of what is in me in spirit? My soul thinks, plans, feels, it's mind, will, and emotions. What and how does my spirit do? Um, so that really, so to answer your question, but that's what this course is about. To unpack that, the spirit, right? So we are going to look at the faculties of the spirit. And we're going to look at the seven functions of the spirit, right? So um, really, um, let me kind of in a very concise way answer this question, but the co entire course is going to be an answer to this very question. Because, you know, in a, a lot of our, preaching and teaching, we focus so much on the soul, we don't realize the spirit part of us. This is so important. And uh, we don't, we're not really conscious of the faculties of the human spirit and the functions of the human spirit, right? So the course and that course is an answer to this question. But very, to put it very, very um, succinctly, the spirit is your real person. The body is not our real person. The soul is not our real person. The spirit is the real person. And the spirit has been designed by God, created by God, to be able to connect to the spiritual realm. So we connect to the unseen realm, you know, and we will be mentioning that in the next point. We connect to God, we can experience God, we can know God in the spirit. But the spirit also connects through the soul into the 
natural realm. Now think about the spirit as a person, meaning the spirit has faculties that it's able to see, hear, taste, smell, and feel or know. The spirit has functions, just as, you know, when we understand a person, a person is able to say and do things. The spirit also has functions. And we are going to discover that. And the spirit is a real part of us because it is eternal. Our human body is um, finite. It's going to die. So one day, you know, all things that we develop in the body, let's say a person goes to the gym and builds all his muscles and all of that, all that's going to go away one day. It's going to die. Same thing with our mind. Uh, you know, we go and educate our mind and we develop our mind. Uh, but one day when the body dies, all that knowledge will go away. But the spirit is the eternal part of us. It's going to go on and on and on forever. And one day the spirit will be clothed with a glorified body for, for us who are believers in Jesus. And, you know, that, that we will discover in a separate course. But what we are going to discover in this course is the role and the functions and the, the faculties and the functions of the human spirit and how God works in the human spirit. Okay. So it's kind of a small answer to your question. Your question is really is, uh, it's all about the course and we're going to, um, and as we go through the course, basically we are answering that question. Christopher, your question, please. Uh, yes, Pastor. So um, what I'm trying to understand is, uh, also maybe I just at a high level, um, spiritual attacks, um, do they come via the spirit or do they come um, more, mostly from, you know, through the, through the mind? Um, and, um, or also could it come, you know, through the emotions uh, and sometimes maybe, I don't know whether it comes through the body. So just at a high level, if, if you could answer that question, please. Mm. Yeah. So one part uh, later on coming uh, coming up later on is the interaction of the human spirit with the spiritual world. But uh, we will answer your question. So when we talk about spiritual attacks, so we're talking about evil spirits, demonic powers attacking. And let's assume it's a believer, right? Now, evil spirits cannot attack the human spirit of the believer directly. Why? Because the spirit, the human spirit, is the dwelling place of God. It's the Holy Spirit is dwelling there. So the evil spirits cannot go and attack the spirit of a believer directly. So the only way, only other way to try to get in and attack, I mean, try to attack the believer or disturb the believer is either in the natural through the physical body or in the realm of the soul, in the mind, will, and emotions. What we do see, or what we can say is, a major effort of the enemy is in the area of the mind, you know, in, in attacking the believer. That means trying to interject our thoughts or trying to affect our emotions through the means they have, which is through lying thoughts and imaginations. We're trying to interject that into our mind. Um, so that would be the primary way. And then they would try to do things in the natural. So maybe uh, come against the physical body, maybe it's some sickness or disease, or maybe attack through circumstances and situations, you know, uh, trying to disrupt, disturb, create confusion, animosity, all of these things the enemy can try to do in the circumstance, in the natural, to try to disturb the believer. Ultimately, they do want to hit the spirit, right? Because that's where faith is and that's where we are rooted and grounded in Jesus. But they can't get there directly, so they will have to try to use either the natural or to use the psychological, the mental, soulish realm. Okay. 
But why do we say that the soulless realm is the most important? Because Satan is a deceiver. So that's his primary tool, deception. So deceptions usually take place through the mind, you know, by putting in wrong thoughts, um, uh, lies and deceptions. He's called the father of lies. So that's his main tool, primary tool. So the primary realm of attack will be in the mind, lies and deceptions. Okay, good questions. Uh, another question here from Divya. What is the difference between the soul and the conscience of a person? Good question. So in section two, we will be talking about one of the functions of the human spirit, which is conscience. Conscience is really the voice of the human spirit. And it's the moral voice of the human spirit. So what we will see uh, as we go along is God has pre-programmed into the spirit, the human spirit, a law, a moral law. That's why people have a general sense of right and wrong. This is right, this is wrong. You know, lying is wrong, cheating is wrong. I mean, they don't go to school to get educated on that. I mean, it's something in, innate in every person. Where did that law come from? We will see in scripture that God put that law in the human spirit in every person. And the expression of the voice of that law coming out of the spirit of man is the conscience. So the conscience is God's moral law being voiced by the human spirit. But sadly, we will also see when we study about the functions of the human spirit is that the conscience can be dulled and it can also be seared. It can be completely terminated. So what happens? People who are born, all of us, who are born innately with a conscience given to us by God can become so hardened like we have no conscience. That means we reach a point where doing wrong, it doesn't disturb us. Why? We have destroyed the voice of our human spirit. We have completely written out the law that God programmed into our human spirit. And so there's no more conscience. The conscience is seared. So they can do anything. The most violent and evil things they don't, and not feel bad about it but they were not born like that. Every person was born with a conscience. Okay, so we will, this is one of the functions of the human spirit and we will talk about it, okay? So, good questions. Now, going back to uh, just, you know, understanding the human spirit. So what we said is, we are tripart beings, spirit, soul, and body. And the spirit and soul are distinct, Hebrews 4.12. In the New Testament, heart and spirit are used interchangeably. And also we pointed out that the spirit or the heart is referred to as the person. I'm not sure there were more questions. I hear some ringing. Okay, let's um, okay, let me pause. Okay, Kishin, your question. I don't know if I missed you. You have a question, Kishin? Okay, we can't hear your question. All right, I'll put it down. Put your hand down. Uh, or oh, Simran, you have a question? All right, um, let's go forward. I thought, okay, Mangi, you have a question? Yes, I have a question. Right. Um, if I understand well, um, the soul is the medium between uh, the body and the spirit. So whatever comes from whatever 
the census of our body picks picks up before it's, it, the only way it can reach to our spirit is through the soul. And whatever the spirits want to communicate to the body has to go through our soul. So the soul is the decider, is the has to decide. So the will. So my question is when we, we die, when we go to, to heaven, does this which one goes to heaven? Because the body remains on earth, and then now we are left with the the soul and the spirit. Which one goes to heaven? Does the soul also go to heaven or is it just the spirit? Thank you. So okay. Much. Good question. So, so basically when a person dies, we are saying spirit, soul, and body. When a person dies, what dies, what continues? So we know the body dies. So everything physical dies. It goes back to the dust, decays. So that means the brain, which is the physical organ through which part of the soul is expressed, dies. But there is the inner man, which has the spirit and also the soul functions connected to the spirit that continues. So we would say the body and the soul dies as far as the physical part of the soul dies, but the spirit lives on. But when we say the spirit, we must also understand that there is certain aspect of the spirit which seems soul-like. That means the emotions. So the spirit man is not void of emotions. Example, uh, when Jesus gave us a story of the rich man and Lazarus, when the rich man died and he went into hell, he was still conscious. conscious. He could feel the torment of hell to the point where he said, you know, at least somebody can dip the tip of the finger in water and, you know, just, just to soothe his pain. He knew that that he had his brothers here on earth. And he said, if somebody could go and tell them about, you know, life hereafter. So he was aware of that. So that means that aspect of his soul, his feelings, his emotions didn't die. Right? So that, that continues. So to answer your question, plainly, spirit and soul die. I mean, body and soul die and the spirit lives on. But we must keep in mind that the part of us which continue to live is not void of emotions. It is a real person, the hidden person, which has feelings, which has you know, recognition and so on. So generally we would say the body and the soul of a person dies and a spirit lives. That's James chapter two, verse 26, right? The body without the spirit is dead. So that means the spirit leaves the body when the body dies. But we must also be clear that when we say the spirit lives, it doesn't mean the spirit has no feelings. The spirit has feelings. So the spirit is the person. And um, we would see that in our interactions with the spiritual realm, there is recognition, there is emotion, there is all the interactions that we would expect of a human person still happens through the spirit. Thank you, okay? sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Christopher, your question. So just to add to what you just mentioned, uh, Pastor, um, would, would, the, would the spirit that has, um, has gone to heaven, would it also include um, 
some aspects of the intellect also, uh, you know, memory, for example, um, recognition of um, you know people that uh, that we have that we have some of our close ones, our close ones, our loved ones uh, on Earth, and um, uh, you know possibly uh, other aspects there of the intellect. Uh, mm. So, just wanted to understand that, if that would also be included. From what we see um, uh, in scripture, Paul says, you know, um, we will know even as we are known. So there is knowing happening in the spiritual realm. Now, to what extent would we know things in the sense that, okay, once a person dies, and the spirit has gone to heaven. Uh, uh, we know that we are in the presence of the Lord. And um, we know even as we are known. And uh, there is spiritual knowing there. We are very aware of God and others there. Uh, will we remember some of things here on earth or will we not? I don't know. I don't know. I, uh, how much of earth we will remember in heaven? I don't know. Right? But will we know in heaven? The answer is yes, because you know the Bible tells us that at least in two places, First Corinthians thirteen, and also in First John chapter three. In both of these places, it says, you know, we will know as we are known. Right. So that means there is knowing. That means I will be able to recognize. I will be able to know the people. But will I know or will I have memory of things here on earth? My feeling is no. Right? Uh, we, will, um, uh, we will be able to recognize things in the spiritual realm as we are there. But I don't think we're going to carry memories of things here on earth there. I mean, the sense of oh, remembering all the wrong things we've done or all those things are past. It's gone. That's my... Uh, understanding because we do have reference that we will know things in heaven okay All right we have two more questions uh, let's take that before we close but uh, in some sense can we say that the spirit is actually the seat of feeling and emotions of understanding god but while on earth we are given the soul and also the body to operate through in some degree Another question, how can some of our soul die and some of it live on unless that is actually coming from our spirit? Yeah, so the first question, I think I would put it this way. The spirit is the real person, which has the faculty of feeling, understanding as we will see, right? So all the five faculties that we see in the natural physical body, are also seen in the human spirit. And the human spirit is a real person. So the, the human spirit has these five faculties. We will see it in scripture, right? That is coming up, I think, uh, in one of the chapters uh, coming up. So part of the human spirit is the ability to feel. So that's why I was saying, right? Um, that some of the soul, the functions of the soul that we understand, which is knowing, feeling, thinking, understanding, is carried by, is part of our human spirit. And so when we say the body and the soul die, we must make it clear that it's not the end of our emotions, it's not the end of our will, it's not the end of our ability to think because we said mind, will, and emotions. So when the soul dies, or that the body and the physical soul, physical functions, physical brain dies, doesn't mean it's the end of our ability to feel, think, because it's part of the hidden person, it's part of the uh, spirit. Is that okay? Did I answer your question there? Shri, 
Uh, come on, maybe we'll take your question before we close. Go ahead. Please. Thank you, Pastor. Is it audible? Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Well, thank you, Pastor. Pastor, um, I just want to <coughs> sorry need a clarification as um, you know as you as uh, Brother Christopher was asking that question about the memory thing, and um, I just want to know that when we read uh, Luke chapter sixteen about that uh, rich man, and the verse twenty eight says that uh, he actually remembering about his brothers, like mm -hmm. where it says that. For I have five brethren that uh, he may testify unto, uh, lest they also come into this place of um, uh, torment. Mm. So, is this scripture proves that, um, like as uh, as we were discussing, like you know, uh, uh, like we may not remember the uh, earthly uh, things, but in this passage, I need a clarification that whether, even though when, uh, like as you said. Like once the man dies, or uh, even his brain dies, but that emotion is still there. Mm. But uh, uh, is it the part of uh, his remembrance that where he's saying that uh, uh, to the um, you know uh, pleading to the you know Abraham that um, um, that my brothers are in trouble, so uh, please send Lazarus. So the, is it the part of memory, or how you will how how you can mm. help me to understand? Thank you, Pastor. Right, right. So. I would see it as part of the torment, you know, that this man, the rich man in hell, part of the torment is remembrance. So in some way, the memory is serving as part of the torment because he probably remembers all the opportunities he had, but he never opened up to God. And whatever, you know, and, and he's remembering his family and all of that. So I think that's part of the whole torment that's happening. But we don't have that similar picture of a person who's gone into heaven having remembrance of earthly things. So that's why, um, you know, there would be, yeah, this this thing in heaven where uh, that God would you know uh, I, I don't think that torment aspect would be there but I think um, Beth has asked a good follow-up question how do we give an account of our actions before the throne if we don't remember them right so there I think it's going to be you know in in, in the second Corinthians chapter 5 and also in first Corinthians 3 when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ for the work we've done I feel it's going to be a commendation of the of the of the you know the God's okay here's a reward for all the good things you've done it's not uh, somehow it's not going to be a time of shame it's not going to be a time of remembering all our failures but a time of commendation for our faithful service, right? So perhaps to that extent, there is that remembrance of our faithful service and uh, receiving a reward, but definitely without the torment aspect, because heaven is not a place where we would have to recall our own failures and mistakes and, you know, spend three days in mourning. So therefore, The, the process of God rewarding us for the good things we've done would be a celebration, would be a very positive thing. Uh, and perhaps in that context, there would be a remembrance of the works that were done. Okay. But good question. Thank you, Bob. Okay. Okay, we're already four minutes past our break time, but uh, let's do this last one here. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, Beth, Beth's uh, follow-up statement, we could remember our failures in the amazing light of God's grace without the condemnation. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, you know, I mean, for example, we could also say what God says, you know, uh, your sins and your iniquities I will remember no more. 
and he repeats that in several places. In Psalm 103, he says, as far as the east is from the west, I've removed your sin from you. Um, he says, I've buried your sins in the depths of the sea. Uh, Hebrews 10, he says, your sins and your iniquities I will remember no more. So as far as God's, what he has stated, he's not going to recall those things. So uh, we have scripture that tells us about God not remembering our sins and iniquities. So that's why I think there would be not, there would, there would not be a recollection of our, the, the failures, the mistakes, the sins we've done. Okay. A last one, uh, Brother Manoa has asked, when a person dies and his spirit reaches heaven, will he be able to know the things happening in the world? Um, So when we die and go to heaven, will we be able to look down and see what's going here on earth? Uh, to my understanding, the Bible is not very clear about it. What we have is, for instance, in Hebrews chapter 12, there is this picture of a great cloud of witnesses. You know, let us run with endurance the race set before us, seeing that, that we have such a great cloud of witnesses. Let us run. Picture there is about an amphitheater and people on the stands looking in and what's the action that's taking place in the stadium. That's the picture. So maybe, and it's not a definitive thing, maybe people who've gone before us are looking in and seeing what's happening, maybe. But outside of that, in Hebrews 12, we do not have any indication that those who die and go to heaven are looking down at what we are doing. There's no clear scripture on those lines. So my personal answer to that is, to that question, when a spirit dies, when a person dies and a spirit reaches heaven, will he be able to know the things happening in this world? My personal answer to that is normally no unless God wants a particular person to see into the earth realm for something. But normally, no, we don't have you know, scripture that's clearly stating that the spirits who are going to heaven are watching into our earth and seeing all that we are doing. No. So my, my response to that will be normally, no, unless God wants somebody to, you know, opens their eyes and tells them to look in here, which, you know, people have had some experiences and they talk about it. Uh, but it's not backed by chapter and verse. It's more of personal, you know, experiences. Okay, um, fine. The, the the last point I wanted to get across before we, you know, in this introduction is uh, in John chapter 4, verse 22 to 24, God is spirit. God is spirit. So, our primary interaction with God is going to be spirit to spirit because God is spirit. Sure, God can touch our minds and he does touch. Sure, God can touch our bodies and he does touch. But our primary interaction with God on a daily basis is spirit to spirit. And that's why developing our human spirit is so important. Jesus said, you know, when you worship God, you worship in spirit and truth. That means it's a spirit to spirit interaction that we have with God. Then God's dealings with us, first and foremost, start in the spirit. Okay. So we'll pause here. I know we took 10 minutes extra. We'll close in prayer and um, we'll take a 10 minute break and come back for the next class. And since, uh, I'm teaching the next class. You know, we'll, I'll, I'll get it started. In, okay. Could somebody please close in prayer? Hi. Hi. Go ahead. I'll pray. I'll pray. Go ahead, Divya. 
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for this wonderful opportunity, Lord, that you've given us to learn uh, more, uh, Lord, delve deeper, Lord, into this aspect of soul, spirit. Uh, Father, things that uh, may be beyond our understanding, Lord, but what have been revealed in your word, uh, help us understand. Thank you, Father, for um, Pastor Ashish, Lord, uh, for speaking through him. Father, for all the uh, answers, Father Lord, that we that for the questions that we had, uh, we pray, Lord, in these coming days, Father Lord, as we learn more, uh, Lord, help us, Father, uh, align uh, our uh, Father spirits, our soul, Father, in in Your ways, Father Lord, uh, help us um, reach, Lord, the the destination, Father, without getting diverted father lord we thank you we praise you father for you are our guide your word is our guide lord your holy spirit is our guide thank you and praise uh, you lord for each and every one um, bless each one of us lord as we go into the next session in jesus precious name we pray amen amen thank you everyone so 10 minutes from now i'll see you in uh, the other class okay thank you sorry for uh, shooting uh, over time, 10 minutes. God bless you. Bye. Thank you, Pastor. God bless. Thank you, Pastor. God bless you.